call this meeting to order. Um, the first item would be to, if we, the agenda, if we have adjustments or changes. We do. Uh, we have a couple members of the public here uh, to speak on uh, posting and kind of hunting on uh, the skate park property. And uh, we're also going to have a brief discussion later about the uh, possibility of applying for the community development block grant uh, for redevelopment of the uh, formerly Dream Cafe, Loving Cup uh, Cafe space. Okay. Anyone else? Anybody on the select board? I'm hoping we can talk about uh, Anne's concern regarding the cleaning contract. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Um, the minutes of November 1st and November 4th, 2019. On November 1st, yeah, that was short. Is there a motion with regard to November 1st? That was our emergency meeting. Is there a second? Second. And that is the November 1st one? Um, um, okay. I'm willing to move the whole slate, but that's... Is that your motion? That's my motion. That's my second. Okay. So there's a motion to approve the slate of November 1st and November 4th. Is there any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 The ayes have it. Uh, treasurer report and uh, review and approve bills, warrants, licenses, which we've already signed, authorized some of the items. But Rosemary? Yep. Um, we have received our um, state pilot payment. We received $357,222 and we budgeted $330,000. Oh, good. Also received a current use payment. We budgeted eighty-five thousand. We got ninety thousand six hundred fifty-eight dollars. Okay. And to date, the total is spent of thirty-seven percent, almost thirty-eight percent. Are you happy with that percentage? Winter starts keeps on going like it started. We'll have a thing up winter. Okay. Any other items? And I gave you a list of current limit taxes. Currently, there's seventy-four thousand uncollected with um, principal interest and penalties. At the end of December, we'll send them to the attorney for collection. Well, it doesn't have a payment agreement. And this is for 2018-2019? Yes. Not 19-20, not our current tax. No. Right? no. Okay. okay. And the current taxes, totally, um, we had installment due on November 12th. We're at a total of 55, 55% collected for the year, which is slightly better than the previous two years, by about a half a percent. That's all in the head. Okay, well, we're not... Uh... Probably now. Go to uh, the Road Commissioner's report. Uh, Brian's not coming. Is Brian Crosby? No, Brian Crosby won't be back until, uh, I don't know if his first day back is Tuesday or if his uh, last day out is Tuesday, but okay. he'll be back this week. Um, 
So a uh, little bit of how the road crew has been going. Things have been going pretty well for the, the road crew. They've got, um, you know, the trucks are all in good shape. They were running, we were able to run a full fleet for, um, you know, the shoveling or the, the plowing we had to do last week. Uh, they're ready for whatever the storm leaves us today. Uh, and they've begun early, they've begun and completed uh, opening up a single lane on Rocky Road for access to Hunter Road uh, based on feedback we got from the local residents that our initial thought about uh, running behind the house between the barn and the house uh, uh, across Brian. Jones, Jones. Brian Jones property, thank you. Uh, wasn't going to work out for the residents, so we had to reconsider. Uh, so we're running across the front of the house on a single lane. The bridge is still closed to uh, traffic, but it, we were able to provide enough access for the Snowmobile Club to use Scribner Bridge. So is the where we're going even in the front of the house are we within our right of way or are we on we are within our right of way uh, but again we didn't open it up to two lanes just a single lane uh we're kind of <clears throat> impacting the because we don't have approval for reconstruction uh and improvements there yet we haven't gotten into it we're trying to still work with fema and uh couple of other organizations. LCPC is helping us navigate that. We don't have any, I don't have anything to report on for um, anything specific about that, but we're still seeking for funding to make improvements rather than just simple repairs. Anybody been up to see it? This has been good. It's not up to grade. It's a little bit lower. Uh, I've tried to conserve as much gravel as possible, uh, but the job does look very nice and uh, vehicles should be able to get through there, no problem. Good. The residents are, Brian's? Yeah, the residents are asking with it. Yeah, everybody was concerned is happy and okay. as well. Okay. What, uh, is there anything from the, the town highway thing with regard to the FEMA emergency or the declaration? Are we going to get money out of this at some point for? That's still the hope is to recover as much cost as we can. We've tracked hours and material uh, that went specifically to flood related causes. So we've got a pretty good tally that unfortunately I don't have personally, but we've got a pretty good tally of uh, all the expenses that went into uh, flood mitigation work. You know, you know how many uh, yards went up to Scribner Bridge? No, I don't know. That uh, was a decent number. We had several truckloads. Yeah, there's more than several. Um, the last thing uh, that you might hear about the uh, Dodge's truck was hit in front of downtown Pizza last week. Uh, we don't believe it was one of our trucks. But somebody's pickup was hit downtown by a plow, presumably by a plow truck. Uh, nobody saw the incident. We're helping the sheriff with their search on this, but we don't believe it was one of ours. And whose truck? It was, uh, I'll say Frank Dodge, but that's not right. Pete, Pete. Pete Dodge, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, any more questions? Any questions for Brian about highway? All right. So, so the next one will even be harder. Planning Commission report. We have no one here from the Planning Commission. No. Okay. So that <coughs> gets us to the administrative report at seven twenty-five. Is there anything you feel that? Uh, <coughs> guessing that for people coming in, I know that we have uh, a couple people present for uh, the discussion about 
the school buses and for, which is our first item up, uh, we've also got guests for the uh, hosting at the skate park. Um, well, my uh, question is if we should wait till 725 for some of these because other people might come in for hmm. that schedule item. So why don't we can start with the hunting? Okay. Since we're adding that. Yeah. All right. So, sorry, uh, Jean and Sheila approached uh, the office staff, including myself, last week. Yes. Yeah, uh, Jean, Jeannie came down uh, and asked about posting a safety zone sign. Yeah, in the past, we had had safety zone signs and they never required a name. It was just a sign that it was a safety zone. Um, so that's what I thought I was picking up. I, I heard, heard that you guys had signs. So I stopped in and um, I talked to Susan and she brought the signs out. I said, well, I guess we need to get permission then because this is we are not the owners of this land, because it says owner on there. What we were talking about is, if you go down Westville Road, I live at the very end of Westville Road. Um, Sheila lives- I border the skate, my property line borders the, the back part of the skate park line there. Uh, but we've had, we, we've had a couple of small young, and there was the mother here that had been there since spring. And in the past, we've we never had an issue with, with any hunters showing up. And you would think that with houses on both sides and houses up above on the hill, no one would come there to hunt. But that's not the case. <laughs> we, we, have a, we have a couple small uh, go there and, and a mother go that have been there throughout the season. And then during the flood, um, the, dog, the the small one of those small goat came swimming across the this mm -hmm. one was the skate park, but it was filled with water. And it came to the road there and stood. And there was someone who was taking pictures, filming it on their camera. And I don't know if it went out on social media or what. But um, when it came youth hunting, we had hunters show up. And I didn't realize that it was a law that you could not shoot in the village. And, and obviously they didn't either. Uh, I, I don't believe that, it, that they shot, the, I haven't seen the deer, but I, I don't believe that they shot the deer, but it, it, it made us aware that we should have it close to There's too many residents, children, kids. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of surrounded by either trail park or the houses around at the top of the hill. Um, we also have, if you go down through there, on the opposite side of the road, there's a, a row of large pines, and we've had a lot of suspicious activity on the other side of the pines. Some people are sleeping in their cars there overnight, or there are like two cars meeting. You can't see who it is through the bushes because the trees are so thick. It, there, there may be two cars meeting there, and then all of a sudden, they, in just a few minutes, and then they take off. So we don't know if something is being traded off there. We do we, know there's white latex gloves there. Yeah, there's someone left there. So I don't know. I don't know, and we don't know what sort of signs you would consider putting there, but. Um, it all started with the hunting piece. <laughs> yes. This is within the village limit, correct? This part of the parcel is not within the village limit. Okay. Uh, the village limit, it doesn't run square on any roadways in that area. Yeah. Uh, but there's no part of the village limit that's on the west side of Westcombe Road, uh, which is where both of your properties are. Uh, and where the skate park is. And where, where I the mean, skate where park itself is. That parcel spreads on both sides of the road, but 
the area we're talking about is entirely on the west side, which is not within the village. Now, do any of you know how far they have to be from a dwelling to shoot? Is it 500? That's 500 feet. Uh, this statute refers to a safety zone, which is a possibility for posting. Um, where we would put up signs that let people know that they were within 500 feet of an occupied dwelling. Uh, but I don't believe that absent these signs, I don't believe that that's a restriction. I, I think the assumption is right. that they have to be notified that they're within 500 feet. Is a safety zone sign the same as a sign that just says posted? No. Yeah. Okay. The trouble is today, you know, years ago, if people uh, knew there were houses close by, they Absolutely. wouldn't even bother. They'd stay Absolutely. clear. But unfortunately, today we have a lot of people that just don't use their head. Absolutely. Yep. And then it makes us go another step further and add more bureaucracy and more do nots yeah. to a situation. And unfortunately, we're going to have to do something like this. To make it safe for the people in that area. Well, like this doc, this was it started youth hunting season, and he does, doesn't even park over on the other side and walk down through there. Drives down through with the window down, looking, and drives way over to the end of, to the skate park and as far as they can go to the ramps. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, you're not even getting out to go in the woods. Um, well, because there's just a big clump of bushes there, and that's generally where they would hide in the woods, usually not in the field. Well, seems like we should put up the safety zone signs. But also, just for information, um, if you see suspicious act, when you see a suspicious activity down there, even before, definitely call the sheriff's office. By the and... time they get there, they're long gone. I know, so but. But if they just know that it's an area where weird stuff happens, they will patrol there more frequently. Um, so, get yourself some good binoculars and get a license plate. Oh, we could do that. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm scared. Yeah. Yeah. So is. I don't see any. Does, is there any reason not to? No, it should be. Make this a safety happens. zone. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it makes sense regardless if you had seen any. I mean, I mean that's just a, that's a public, public, public park space. where kids yeah. are riding their bikes. Yeah. So would you, did you have uh, safety zone signs yourself before? No. It, we used to way back, but we don't anymore because we uh, uh, sold the village of Johnson the land around us, and they, we had it in our writing that the land would be closed. This we is don't the have to, we don't wellhead around yeah. our house. And the skate park has never been an issue until this year. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the past few years, I have not ever seen anyone over there hunting. Well, thank you for bringing it to our attention. Yeah. Well, the wellhead is owned by the village, isn't it? It is. And so the village is, I believe the village posts that, but I'd have to. It, yeah, it's the village post. Okay, I, th I thought so. I thought yeah, that was your way down back. Yeah. Near the water building. Yeah. yeah. So I'll move that we um, designate the skate park parcel as a safety zone and um, put the signs up accordingly. posted accordingly. Second. Is there any discussion? I would just note that I think that we have to the portion of the land, and it may all be within 500 feet, but the safety zone has to be within 500 feet of a dwelling. Yeah, so I it's believe that Doug is correct, that we wouldn't be, we wouldn't exactly post around the perimeter of our parcel, we would post in, an era, in areas that are within 500 feet of occupied dwellings. 
Oh, that's confusing. So, no. it, yeah, because then that means you're going to open up. You're going to have to come down the hill from the residence at the top um, 500 feet. Come over from me 500 feet. It's going to leave like a big square in the center of the park that would not be considered a safety zone. I believe that it would be the case. So, uh, the, the and I'm not sure so if that's something you still right. Well, that's the safety zone. You can post land outside of safety zone. The safety zone is just a specific feature. Okay, so there doesn't have to be a residence within 500 feet. Well, if you're posting safety zone, the motion was for a safety zone. I thought that was going to do. So why don't we just post it as no trust, no, no hunting? We could do that. That would be the best thing to do. If you're going to amend that, I'll second all the second your amendment. That's going to solve. That's going to yeah. That, that, that that addresses no. amend it to a, a no hunting. Post it as no hunting. In that. Second. Is there any further discussion? So you would hearing none. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. The ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Amy, I also wanted, while well, I have you, thank you for always clean, picking up trash throughout the world. Well, I haven't been for the oh, well. last month and a half because I got hit by a car here at the crosswalk one morning. So um, I'm just getting back in the bus. I, can't, I couldn't bend to pick, pick up oh, the really? last month. Oh, so, oy, oy. Uh, yeah, we, uh, Kylie and I were crossing the crosswalk and the car stopped. And another car stopped and was turning on the railroad street. And I started to cross, and he didn't see me, and he just stepped on it. And oh no! So, <laughs> okay, well, I'm glad you were okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's. If there are no objections, let's do the cleaning contract to to get to. Uh, I think we're at about seven twenty. Apple oh, says we're at 721. Okay. Apple's <laughs> wrong. <laughs> so is my watch. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, question about the cleaning contract. I have reached out. I, I, I sent the contract. I, I sent what we had into our attorney for their review. Uh, their opinion on it was that it was uh, a pretty rough agreement and if we wanted something more formal that they would get back to us with uh, an actual contract um, and I have not gotten that actual contract back yet. Uh, but the, the basic summary is that we, we've entered into a very rough agreement with the Latiris but we, have, we don't have a formal contract with them. Uh, What's the difference between a rough agreement and no formal contract? $300. Four months. We we don't have anything binding with them at this time. Okay. But we have an implication there. Okay. Your question? Well, I my question was just that I think we need to address this and take care of it if we can. If that's the, our feedback from the attorney, then we need to act on it. Anne had requested that we take action on it sooner than later, and it's been about six weeks. And uh, I think one way or another, we owe her an answer. Um, my my take on it is is that the. We didn't really have a very formal bid process, um, or at least the traditional rules of a bid were not put into place when we awarded this contract. Nonetheless, we did um, we did give it to the Latiris, and I think that there's a reasonable expectation that they would have it for a certain period of time. And it doesn't feel right to yank it out from under them at this point because we goofed up the process. On the other hand, it doesn't feel fair to our employee. Um, the other party who might have been 
she's interested in bidding, you know, but I think we, we didn't handle it very well for her. Um, so I'm wondering if there's another, I talked to Brian about um, leaving the contract, potentially leaving the contract with libertarians, um, at least for a period of time, at least a year, um, and seeing if we have budget and availability of ants interested in extra work beyond, um, so it comes to about 150 bucks a week, I, I believe. Uh, it's 195 is what we're paying the materials. But she was only interested in the 100, the, she wasn't interested in the library bit. Um, Especially it gets a little more complicated. Okay, she said in her letter to us, she said that the Latiris can continue doing the other yep. buildings, that she was just interested in this. Um, I don't I'll catch up with you, but um, so my suggestion would be to see if we have budget. I, the thing with Anne is that she has been here for a long time and she's talented and she knows a lot of our municipal business. She has specialized knowledge that a lot of other people don't have. That if she's interested in uh, more work, I, I think there's probably a pretty good chance that there's more work available to her in some of the areas that she's more familiar with, whereas a lot of people can clean a building. Our decision on that was based upon flawed information. Provided. So probably the best way to do it was to put it out to bed again. This doesn't feel fair to the Latarius, though, does it? Well, if you read that contract, that so-called contract, it isn't really a contract. That's right. So if you look at it that way, we are under no obligation. It's an inferred contract, but it's not a contract. I would say you never have a contract um, or determined whether you have one or not until the, the court has spoken. We can opine on it, but uh, there's always the question of expenses and, and enforcing, and uh, there is goodwill on both sides that we you know, would like to save somehow. I understand that, but it still goes back to the beginning that we were working on flawed information. We thought she did not want the job. And that's what we were told. And that doesn't necessarily fall on the people that we work up in an agreement with. It may fall on us, but it doesn't fall on them. True. But you know as well as I do, that does not really look like a contract contract. I'm hearing our attorneys think that it should be burnished into something, and I think they're over the tipping point because of an opinion on it. I'm just guessing. Well, I don't understand why we don't have a, a reading on that for this meeting. It wasn't on the agenda. I thought we had looked into that and to see if that was a legal contract, and we had discussed that in the past. We did. We asked the attorney for an opinion. He gave one to us that it's not a very clean contract. What were your words? Uh, it's not a. It's. It's not a signed binding contract. That's what I just said. Yes. So, then we start over again. Have we? Have you talked to the Latiris? What? What? Ideally, what would they? I haven't gotten into it with the Latiris. I imagine, based on other conversations I've had with them, that they are happy and satisfied working here. That they would expect to continue. So. Okay, so they're not willing to flex, flex in any way. It's probably it. Okay, I, I don't know. I don't, know what I don't think that. I don't see a solution in that direction okay. that would satisfy Anne or the Latarius in any way that, in any meaningful way. Okay. The word flex shouldn't be really used because we don't have a contract. We don't, we, yeah, 
I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. We don't have a contract, but what we do have is our word and our integrity. And if we tell somebody that they've got the job and then yank it from them a few months later, that doesn't feel very good. But the whole thing was that it wasn't even signed properly by them. I mean, good grief. Uh, it's, it's a bad situation any way you look at it, but we, we have to resolve it. And it's going to be difficult for one side or the other, but we're going to have to do something. Have our attorneys expressed any opinion as to our exposure with one course of conduct versus another? No. I think that's an appropriate question. I asked that in a follow-up, but I haven't received a response on that yet. But at a certain point, not giving an answer, settling it, settles it. If we keep pushing this off and saying, well, let's keep getting legal opinions, the Leterius keep doing the work and, and Ann doesn't, and that's a decision. Whether we like it or not, that's a decision. Not making a decision is a decision. It may have been a common contract when they started doing the work. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, we can't study it to death. So, so the direction? I would move that uh, both parties or all parties bid again on the job. That's a motion. Is there a second? A second? Can I ask a question? Yes. Is that out of order? No. So the Lutheries, Jessica, Chair of the Library Trustees, so the Lutheries also clean the library. Is there a contract? or lack thereof linked to all town buildings and if you're deciding something asking them to go back out to bid do they is are you bidding the whole all the town buildings or are you bidding just the town office just for better for clarification my understanding it would be the library and the town offices that's what correct. it was in the beginning, correct? That was how it was put up in the beginning. So if we went to start over from scratch, I would assume that's what it would be. Uh, We'd have to start with what we started with. As the library, can I ask Jessica a question as a library trustee? Yeah. Um, they've been cleaning your the library for, what, six, eight months now? Are you pleased with the work they do? They've been very pleased with the work yep. they do as a librarian. And I do, uh, before um, the start of the military, we had Peg Rowe, and she's done it for a really long time. And she was one of those people that would go above and beyond. Yeah. Um, and the Lutheries are going above and beyond um, with the cleaning and doing some of the things that you know, a lot of people don't do. So it's just kind of repeat maintenance. Changing light bulbs, checking, you know, dusting, the, the shades, those sort of things that might get missed. And I do have that attention. So, for lack of a second, the motion would die. Right, I would like to suggest, as a means of compromise, that because Anne has interest in doing more work, I think there's more work to be done speaking with you not make work but things that that we have a problem kind of throughout uh, all of our buildings of a lack of storage we have quite a bit of old documents and storage in this building uh, some of which we if we had a document retention policy we might be able to get rid of some of the documents and free up a little bit of space And, and helped with our ancient roads program and helped a lot with keeping the vault organized. Uh, I think that this would be something that she could be very helpful with. And that would be within our budget? I would have to, I'd have to compare what we had budgeted for custodian and uh, services for but 
This is a make work project because the board doesn't want to act what it looks like to me. To the contrary. I mean, it's, uh, we don't want to act. Is there any motions? We don't want to resolve the situation, so we want to make some work for somebody to appease them. That's what it looks like. Well, we put someone in a, in a we did not handle the process properly. Right, that's true. So we're in a difficult situation. And yeah, we're trying to find a compromise to get out of it. It's not, now, is it just throwing money at her because there's, we wanna throw money at it and make it easy for ourselves? No, here's a person that's qualified to do a certain task that a lot of other people aren't qualified to do. Um, I think it's nice. That's true, but it would be a whole lot cleaner if we'd resolve the, the custodial contract in the beginning. Yeah, but I, I find that that would be, I, the solution that you offered, I think, is insulting to the Lateries in the intent of the agreement, the unofficial agreement that we made with them. But you know it wasn't signed properly. That wasn't really a contract. It wasn't a contract, but we had a, done it. We had an opinion. Yeah. So, any motion? your idea in that but don't we need to absolutely make sure that I mean before yeah. we make a motion oh, yeah. we need to make sure that the budget can support this idea. Yeah. The budget we didn't don't know that Anne would even want it to. Right. Okay. Um I'm thinking we aren't going to get to this any further. And so I'd like to move on to the administrator's report. It was a hand up in the audience. Oh I missed that. I was just going to say, it's not for my understanding, a lot of times, especially in Vermont, a lot of contracts are just word of mouth, and once it's happening and you're getting paid for it, that's the contract. And so even though it's meant to have a signed formal thing, it, 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 yeah, I, I, I see it as something that's um, not, not necessarily the final. Scott? Yeah. I'm just, you know, I'm a lawyer, so I might be completely impressed on this. So if you offer somebody work, you're doing the work, you're paying for the work, and the work is satisfied or satisfactory, and actually someone paying above, above that threshold, isn't that sort of binding at that point legally? That's our dilemma. The deal is that the question we put it out for bid and was the bid process flawed in that? So that therein lies the dilemma. So um, did you have to put it out for bid? Did no. you, is that what your job is? Is to put it out for bid? No, we could have chosen not to, I believe, but we did. If so, we were going to award it to, or it gets a little complicated. If we were going to award it to an employee who was employed in another capacity. It had to go out to bid, okay. but we didn't award it to an employee, so we wouldn't have had to take it out to bid in order to award it to the other the people. people who are not employees. Okay. All right. All right. I'm. You only could say it once, so we're <laughs> not going to try it again. All right. Local administration report. Yes. Two one. Uh, we have uh, Deb Clark from the school district who would like uh, to be available on, by phone. So I'm going to give her a call and put her on speakerphone. But the. Is this why you're here today? For the school bus? Okay. Deb, do you want to give any background information? Well, he's going to. Oh. Just getting Deb on. And I probably will. Okay. Um, 
Hi, Deb, it's Brian. Good. I'm going to put you on speakerphone and uh, carry on with the meeting. Thanks. Okay. So our the Lamoille North School District is experiencing a uh, a little bit of a change in the busing schedule that we has been brought to our attention. Um, yeah, I believe it's a combination of factors that are leading to a driver shortage and a rebalancing of routes. Um, the purpose tonight is kind of the select board. And there was an article in the newspaper about this. Some of the members have heard from residents or, or been impacted themselves, uh, but there hasn't been an opportunity for us to really hear about the issue uh, in open meeting more formally and have any kind of discussion about it and what the role of the select board should be. Um, so that's kind of our purpose here tonight. Uh, I can turn it over to Doug. Uh, well, th this is an issue that's uh, personally of concern to me because uh, I now have in my home a first grader and a second grader uh, that we've been personally transporting um, to the elementary school. Um, the children are Holly Brown's children. Uh, and my neighbors, uh, uh, Jessica and Jeffrey Bickford, uh, they're all meeting at the bus stop. So what's happening is maybe Jessica can, from her point of view, tell us what's, what the facts are as far as your kids. Thank you. So I was asked her to come to share our experiences um, so for the last two years, we actually homeschooled, and then we decided to make the decision, um, not knowing the bus schedules had changed, to put our kids back in, in public school. Um, so we found out on day two of school that there was no afternoon bus route to our, our neighborhood. Um, we did know when we moved up there that we would not have door-to-door -door service, um, that the nearest bus stop would be at the Fox Road, um, and we were okay with that. Um, so the um, day, day one, we just kind of drove our kids in. Day two, we, we were ready um, and then found out um, mid-morning that there was no afternoon bus um, to our region anymore. And there had been when we um, took the kids out and started homeschooling. Um, and so this was a surprise. Um, so uh, Jeff called the, um, the superintendent's office I was told about this bus shortage, uh, driver shortage, and that they restructured the routes and that there wasn't um, an option. The option that was suggested was the possibility of our, we have a sixth grader and an eighth grader, which would be on two separate buses anyways. Um, the option for our sixth grader was Benover Road, uh, so about two miles from our house, or that she could, this was from the superintendent's office, potentially ride the entire elementary school bus route to the high school, middle school, and then get on Nate's bus, and then get as far as Swamp Road, which is still about a mile from our house. Um, the Janet Davis in the elementary school office said, no, that's against policy. We are not, we don't allow children to ride the complete bus route. So um, that kind of took us um, transportation totally off the table for us. Um, so Mondays, we pick up, um, we take time off from work, readjust work schedules. Um, and then Tuesday through Friday, fortunately, because they're sixth and eighth grade, they're relatively independent. Um, they ride the bus to the library, and then we pick them up there um, when, when it's most convenient. But um, that's, that's been our experience and, and our um, workaround for them. That's certainly open to creative problem solving options. It would be nice for them to be. What Janet Davis said about the policy. Um, I remember we did discuss the um, line through that um, Janet Davis informed us that it was not the elementary school's policy to let students ride the entire route and go out of town. And by going to the middle and high school, that would put um, her riding out of the community of Johnson. And so that was not an option. Okay. 
Could I ask Holly how it's working? Can I ask Holly how it's working for you? It doesn't because I didn't have a real ball. Watch kids go to school, you expect the bus to transfer at both ways. If they can't, you gotta depend on someone else. And if they can't do it, your kid can't go to school. What are you supposed to do? My house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to identify yourself for the record? Oh, well, I'm Mark Nielsen. Uh, I'm on the school board. This is a merged school. So I'm one of five that voted by Johnson to upload on the union to oversee six out of the five elementary schools, middle school, high school, and university schools. So we did something that Dr. Johnson has done to me with my heart. So I guess from that point of view, I'll give it a go. Um, very long in school or something and see if we can figure something out. My, uh, you know, I suggested this. To the agenda because I considered it a you know something I was here. It's not because I was experiencing it firsthand, but it's because uh, you know it's almost like redlining a neighborhood. You know you don't have you you don't have bus. You don't have uh, there. You know yeah. Well, we could say that too, but uh, it, it's uh, uh, your the children are in jeopardy. A first and second year old at the corner of Ben Ober and Clay Hill. You know, you got to be there, walk home, not walk home. Uh, I understand the, the problems of, of the, that this is, that at the upper level of the school district. I, 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 I talked to, I spoke with Deb about this at one point in time, um, and uh, I would love to see a conversation uh, because this is a matter of community need. I, I don't know if what the other select board members say or think. Well, I think I can echo what Deb is saying. We've been dealing with the past couple of years where you get your budget, and all of a sudden we were so concerned about the budget money per se for the for the school buses. We were all of a sudden came into the contractors we had hired, who was just no drivers of it. And then you hear it on Channel 3 News, it's a statewide problem. Well, that doesn't answer it. And I know that the um, superintendent and Deb have both been working within the communities to try to find a way around it so that we can get more, more drivers. If it comes down to a state licensing issue with the drivers, because we've already lost a bunch of them. But we need to solve this problem, so it's a little bit Is that becoming their CEO? Yeah. Is that becoming their CEO? I think it has something to do with that. And the state tightened down the reins a little bit on the licenses as a whole. And as soon as they tightened down the licenses as a whole, we lost some drivers. As soon as you lost the drivers, all of a sudden you got X amount of drivers for X amount of buses, and this is what you're going to end up with. So. Can I, I'm sorry, I, I can only hear a little bit of what some people are saying, like they're too far away. I think Mark just was talking about the driver shortage, is that correct? Yes. Yes. Can I just sort of give a little history of what happened last year? So there is a, there's a nationwide driver shortage. It's finally sort of Vermont. Um, at the end of last year, it had gotten so bad that we were often canceling routes at the last minute because there was nobody to fill in, no substitutes. <laughs> to drive a big bus, you have to have certain um, school bus driving endorsements. <clears throat> you can drive a smaller bus if you've got your CDL without having all the big endorsements. Um, <clears throat> So, for instance, Memorial Valley Transportation coach drivers can drive a small bus or a van but can't drive um, a big school bus, even though they can drive a coach. So, LBC, between sicknesses and a driver shortage, um, in total, were just unable to meet all the routes that they had. So, at the end of the school year, to avoid that kind of confusion and last minute 
minute interruptions of services. We worked with LBT, and LBT worked very hard to redesign their route with the resources available. And I want to stress that the resources are not financial resources. It really is a driver problem. To figure out, extend some routes, eliminate some routes, um, and make sure that they could meet those obligations as much as possible all year long to avoid those last-minute interruptions. Now, we know we're coming into the winter season. There's going to be weather issues. Um, we hope that there won't, be, there won't be drivers calling in sick, but people get sick. Um, we do have one issue, for instance, the J2 route is a small bus. The driver of that bus is licensed to drive a bigger bus, However, she is supposed to be a substitute only. Um, and if she gets called away to drive a different route on a bigger bus, we now have a problem um, on J2. The number of students on J2 are accommodated on a regular basis with that smaller bus. These are the kinds of considerations that have been put in place so that there wouldn't have to be um, jockeying around last minute or worse complete interruption of a route. Um, and I, I hope that, did, can everyone hear me? Yes, I think yeah, so. It looks, it looks like it. So at the very end of last year, we sent out a notice to all families that LBT would be changing routes and explaining the bus driver shortage issue. In July, the new routes were published. I think they were in the paper for over a month. They've been on our website. We've talked with multiple families and parents, and we've tried to work out what we can, and there's sometimes we're just not able to make accommodations. Um, I would like to talk to the experts a little bit more about the solution we came up with. I wasn't aware that wasn't working. Um, uh, you know, I, we would love to be able to put the bus routes back to the way they were, we just can't guarantee uninterrupted service. Um, well, we can't guarantee un un uninterrupted service at all, but there really is a bus driver shortage. Uh, Hyde Park also has lost uh, routes. Routes were extended. Uh, some routes went to common stops instead of door to door. Really, LBT is stretched to their limit. And if, if we could just create drivers that would Great bus driving um, difficult. Getting a bus driver endorsement is difficult. There's a bunch of regulations involved that I wasn't really aware of until the last six months. Um, so it's not like we aren't trying. We've also looked at, you know, maybe some creative uh, recruiting solutions. It's not something that's going to change overnight, and I'm very cognizant after how last year ended, that we not promise something that we may not be able to um, deliver. These children, as, or three of them could, as far as I understand, it could be on one bus from the elementary school, and they would be dropped off at uh, the corner of Ben Ober and Clay Hill. There are actually four kids coming to a single location, um, and I I don't know, I would accept Mark's uh, solution that uh, you find a solution for it. Um, well, I would, need, I would need to talk with you individually about the specifics. If there's a different bus they can ride that would solve your particular issue, I'm happy to talk with you about it. May Jessica? I ask a question? Um, you mentioned the the driver requirements for a van or a smaller bus were different. Do you, what is are those requirements, and would it make sense? I know the district has some vans that are run to get kids from, that are coming from one school to another that are traveling throughout the day. Is that would that be a viable after school option as well? The district vans um, aren't available for um, regular transportation. Those are um, special service vans, and they also are overwhelmed right now. Um, 
they're really not available for, for general land transportation. Again, we tried that one time, and it was, quite frankly, a disaster. It didn't work out. Um, the specifics for a bus driver endorsement, LBT could speak better to that. And I think, you know, out of this, if there would like to be some meetings to, to, to consider other options, LBT definitely has to be in the conversation. They know the roads, they know the routes, they know their drivers, they know the regulations um, associated with bus driving, the different sizes of buses. So, I mean, it's, you know, my husband's foreman of the road here, and everyone's an expert in plowing, but we all know we're not experts in plowing. You know, we can all stand back and say, well, why wouldn't you do this? Why would you do that? It seems so obvious to me. And then when I talk with LBC, it, it, actually there's a lot behind it that I wasn't aware of. Um, so I would love to have a group for even specific individuals. Doug, it's Doug that's there, right? Yes. Yes. Um, I don't know that I had a specific conversation with you. I think you asked in general. I certainly, it sounds like you have a solution of a different route that the kids could ride. Um, I don't know what your you know, the solution are would be. The conversation, I just am very reluctant to promise something that we may not be able to continue to deliver. To deliver. I would rather you know what's available to you and what's not available to you than change it on a regular basis. Does that make sense? I've lived in this location where uh, since 1977, probably since uh, 1980, the bus went uh, about maybe 20% further than than it's going now. And, right. Uh, and they used to bring large buses across the bridge, uh, which the bridge is now much better. The road is the roads are much better. You know, the roads, of course, in Vermont can you know you cancel school for road conditions. So, okay. uh, so, Doug, so Doug but, what we would need is we need LBT at the discussion also. I'm sorry, I didn't make that up. We would need Lamoille Valley Transportation as part of this conversation as well. Okay. Because they may have information that I don't have about them. All right. Right. And that's fine. We have sat down with LBT. They're, they're very open to conversation, to sitting down and discussing the challenges um, and like I said, there's a lot behind the decisions we've made that we're not always, uh, that's not always obvious. Okay. Any other that's, board members? That's or? fine. If you want to contact me, we can schedule a meeting with LBC. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Has this been discussed with the school board yet? What we're talking about tonight? No, this was, we set this up as a meeting. The, the school administration was not didn't have an ability to be present. We thought, and it was just it was for information uh, for the uh, select board this meeting. But then Deb wanted to call in, and uh, Mark is here. So, so I, you know, if, uh, school board only sets the decision to or not to provide transportation. The um, schedule, the routing, um, the specifics of the transportation really are part of administration and, in our case, our um, contracted service provider, Memorial Valley Transportation. Cambridge also manages um, a bus, bus system. They, too, have a driver shortage and have had to change their route. Um, and Eaton also has um, buses. They've had the same two drivers for years. So they have not been as partially impacted by the shortage yet, we hope. Not really. I'm only the temporary acting chairman. Uh, when Eric Oscar returns, I, I would ask him to uh, invite the uh, you know, administration in and uh, Mark and, uh, and and yourself probably um, Deb is part of the administration. Is this the role of the select board? 
I think the can, I, can I ask what end or what the select board is hoping to accomplish? I mean, I talked briefly with Brian, and he said mostly just information on what's going on. Um, I would and say the challenges this, facing transportation this, right now. This is only a question of uh, it's within what you do with with. Uh, the school busing issue is clearly within the purview of the administration and, and of your your board. This board can only hold up you know, a, a, a camera or the light of day to what you're deciding and, and determine how, make a point of how it's impacting the Johnson residents. Oh, yeah. Uh, just for me and, you know, our board, we have talked about it both at the administrative level, um, as things progress, I know we talked about it at the board level. Everybody is aware of the impact this is having on our community. Um, nobody is unaware of how difficult it can be for families. Um, it's just, like I said before, we can't make promises and services if we can't deliver those services. And if there's no drivers to drive the bus, we're really kind of stuck in this really hard spot. Anybody else have anything to say? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm seeing this as so so many issues. One, um, just a seems like there's been a lack of communication or no communication to the people that um, that the administration claims to understand their impact. So that's that's concerning to me. Um, obviously, this is. It's a huge uh, safety issue, also of potentially kids not being able to get off buses or go to schools. I mean, that's just horrible. And the other thing is, I just feel you know this is this is a this has to be figured out. I mean, how are we going to keep the families that we have here and keep them in our public school system and also attract new families? Like that's that's um, what I'm thinking about as well um, for the future. So I, I'm i really glad that you brought this up, Doug, because I think this is, um, this, this very much does impact us all. Anyone else? You Scott? I just wanted to second Kyle's comments. I think you're great on that. Great on that. Um, Mr. Chairman, yes. does not the school board have their own budget? Town has their own budget as the select board. So are we or are we not usurping our authority by meddling in the school board's issue? Well, you heard my answer before. Well, you're just bringing this to light of day and you're bringing it onto the camera. But we're really <coughs> usurping the select board's authority by meddling with the school board. Well, we have citizens in front of us that are. I understand I, that. Excuse but that me. Was because oh, no, the chairman no, no, my turn. It. Sorry. We have, and that is right. Doug put it on the agenda, and I, and I agree with much of what you're saying that our ability to react to this is very limited. We don't do school busing. I have felt, with one exception, that um, it's been really difficult for citizens in Johnson to get. Um, their voice heard in the school district. And um, I think Mark's been doing a really great job of trying to amend that. Um, but um, it's difficult for people to have their voice heard. And so they're frustrated. And it is an issue of basic fairness and safety. And so it's uncomfortable to sit here and say, as a select board member, there's not a lot we can do for you. But yeah, the, <clears throat> the school board and the administration need I mean, I understand there's a busing shortage. If it maybe they need to pay bus drivers more, um, I think it's appropriate for us to get involved and to say this is really important for our community. And um, okay. anything else? All right, uh, we'll move on to the next item: transfer station agreement. Thank you, Mayor. I have a second comment. My name is Neil on the website. Mark's very responsive and like super nice guy. So thank you for listening. Appreciate it. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Thank you for coming. All right. Uh, the next item up is a draft post agreement with the Johnson Transfer Station. So this agreement is mostly modeled after our prior agreement with the addition of uh, the ability to serve as a. I don't have a copy of it. Behind. Uh, oh, got it. Thank you. Part of the same packet. Uh, with really this uh, condition 9A as an amendment uh, to our existing agreement, where uh, we would allow the stump dump portion to serve as a temporary debris storage and reduction site. Uh, as identified in the state of Vermont's emergency operations plan. Uh, basically, temporary management of debris generated during a storm event. Um, the question had been raised about uh, the world of ash borer and how we could use this facility for that purpose. Um, that isn't really addressed here, but the, the stump dump would be kind of the appropriate place for dealing with uh, emerald ash borer debris as, uh, you know, as disposable debris. Does that mean the stump dump would serve as that location for the entire county for emerald ash borer? Because I hope not. It is <laughs> I, be, I believe that we're still the only stump dump location for the county. Uh, they would not be contaminated receiving contaminated wood that hadn't been treated probably by grinding up uh, before it was brought to the facility. So they wouldn't, we wouldn't be receiving contaminated wood. Uh, and, but that's, if they're the only place in the county, I think it would still be the only place in the county to receive the material. We'd be receiving chipped wood. Yes. Other questions? happy with this, Doug? No. Uh, what I'm not happy with is that, and, and maybe I'm missing it because I'm just looking at it for the first time, is that uh, during a temporary emergency, you can bring stuff in. The temporary status stop will terminate one year from the date of the federal disaster declaration, but there's no indication of uh, uh, how long you retain it or how long you're stuck with it. Okay. That's a long time, though. I sort of think that um, the with the Emerald Ash Borer coming, that uh, other towns should step up with stump dumps. Exactly. Rather than and especially stump. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know where and I don't know how to solve it, but but it, it's not fair, I think, to our citizens. It's not at all. Jim? Has anyone uh, reached out to other towns in South Carolina or people that have experienced it, the dashboard damage in the past what they're doing for us? I don't know. I think it's always a premature to have too much information, but it's a good idea. Yeah, I mean, I know there's a, a local Emerald Ash Borer group that's met and put together a preparedness plan. I'm sure Sue Lovering is familiar with what other towns are doing, but they're creating a space where you deliver infected wood. 
Yeah. I wish she was here tonight. Yeah. Sorry, Michael. I wish Sue was here tonight. Yeah. When does this have to be, when do we have to have a contract with them? We are operating under a continuation of our prior contract. Our prior contract, we can renew at any time. I agree with what Doug said, the other town should, with this crisis with the Emerald Ash Moor, the other town should step up themselves and have some other way of dealing with things rather than bringing all their trash over here to Johnson. I suspect it's going to be overwhelming. Extremely. And, and it could be, if we are the temporary debris, it says temporary debris storage, but I, you know, I, I don't mind being temporary, but I... And if that lasts a year, they're talking about, who's going to monitor all that stuff? I, I think we have to trust the solid waste to yeah, okay. monitor and manage it. Uh, they, we get a bridge somewhere? I and mean, we're trusting them to manage the facility. Mm -hmm. So we have to continue to trust them to manage the facility. And if they're asking for something we don't trust them to manage, then we don't grant them the permission to do it. Yeah. Well, maybe we should resolve that we don't want to be the county's. Uh, Chip storage facility. Well, I think it's I think it's it's both chip storage and it's uh, and it's the question of uh, what do you do with a you know when twenty five buildings go down someplace. Right. That's yeah. The Emerald Ashmore. I mean, I don't imagine <laughs> it's just not going to be efficient to be trucking loads of ash to Johnson. Um, it's going to be most of it. My guess would be bucked up pretty close to where it falls and used as firewood. Um, but it, I am more concerned about, but so I'm really looking for a location for for Johnson's um, ash to go in the situations where it needs, we need to put it someplace. I think that the, the bigger concern is what Doug said about the 25 houses that get destroyed and you need to, you've got a lot of debris in an emergency situation. You said you stick 25 houses in that little spot. <laughs> so is the rest of the agreement? Because I don't see the full agreement. Uh, the rest of the agreement would be unchanged. Oh, it would be? Yeah. Oh, great. Uh, they're willing to re-sign. The, well, the, they've asked for this, so we might have a little bit more back and forth. But this is the change that they've asked for is the adding ourselves as a temporary debris storage and reduction site. Charlie? So temporary debris, you're gonna load it up into a truck and haul it over to Johnson. Why don't we just keep on going to country? I don't understand that. We would not be the only one uh, in the area. These would mostly be for... Uh, a disaster. Yeah. 25 buildings fall down in the next earthquake. They're going to load them into the trucks and haul them to Johnson or to wherever. Why not keep the truck going down the road to cover trucks? Not that far. I couldn't tell you what their rationale or the exact. I don't have a for the mm -hmm. Good question. I say we don't allow them to add 9A to the contract. Is there a uh, consensus or a. Uh... Motion? I'll make that a motion. There is a motion that we uh, do not uh, have condition 9A. Is there a second? Nine A. There's 9A. So 9A involves everything. Subheadings A through I. Yep. Yep. So we can just go back. I can just go back with our existing agreement and re-up that for uh, the same period that it was before. I, that's, my five years. that's my suggestion. Let's go back to them with that and see what they... So there's not a second. We'll let the motion die, but we'll, the instructions are to go back and tell them we're interested in the prior contract. Yes. That, that's it. That's as I understand. That, Kyle? Yeah, I mean... In addition to the concern of what would become
plumbing in terms of debris. I mean, what about, you know? You think it's cleaner to do it that way? Well, let her finish her question, please. Um, I have concerns about the uh, wear and tear on our roads. And I mean, I mean this, this, this has so many repercussions. So that's another argument for just going back. So you're in favor of just going back. I'm in favor of making a motion that we don't even, like I said in the beginning. And excuse me, Kyle, if I stepped on you, you were taking a breath, so I thought maybe you were coming. Sorry to jump on right, so, so, um, you. You do that quite often, you know. <laughs> Very sensitive. Uh, at least once a month. Um, so Mike has a motion. Is there a second that we, uh, that we, to the motion that we send back the contract as, as it existed? Exists now rather than as proposed, uh, and tell them this is the contract we want. Sure. All right, so I'll we got a second. Um, and I'll <laughs> say, you know, if I'm willing to have them come in and talk to us if, you know, it seems like we have a lot of open questions and maybe a conversation. Well, if we take the vote, it's in the affirmative if they want to. They can. Exactly. All right. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Did I hear you, Kyle? Yes. I okay. Do. All right. Uh, procedure for sale of trailer. All right. Oh, that didn't make it into a fact. Right. Well, uh, the procedure for the sale of a trailer, uh, we have a draft notice uh, for making the, the sale of the trailer. The procedure recommended by our town attorney is to, uh, this is for the, the this is the Gost there's the trailer at the Katie Wynn Park that the town acquired at tax sale. We've taken possession of it now. Uh, we believe that the trailer is worth something, uh, but whatever it is, the town doesn't really want to be involved. We just want our money that we are owed for taxes back and uh, plus expenses uh, that we've had to pay for rental, lot rental fees and what. So the Procedure would be to post a notice that we're, we intend to, to sell it and um, the recommendation being that we would hold it at uh, an auction uh, so that we can have different people come in and, and make bids on it. We don't need to hire an auctioneer for it. We can do it relatively informally uh, with uh, myself or Eric or Dave Williams or whoever we bring in to, to do it. So in other words, the, the process is the same for selling town real estate. We put up a notice that we intend to do this and it can be uh, objected to. Yes. But we don't expect it'll be an objection, but we'll start with that process. So we have to follow the normal procedure. Yep. Uh, my recommendation for date and time for the auction would be uh, January 6th at 6 p.m. That's the first Monday in January hour before our regular meeting. Okay. What did the attorney say about two years of ownership for clear title? Rosemary, you asked that. Remember how that went? Well, they can get title insurance up for the trailer. Usually you don't have to go to a bank to get a mortgage. I understand, but whoever gets it isn't going to get a clear title for two years. Possibility that there could be. Yeah, well, I don't think there's any possibility. I think it's a, a true statement that they're not going to get a clear title for two years because that's well, important to state law. Unless you got to have title insurance. Lawyers cannot get title insurance on a tax sale property. Right. But the individual that buys it is not going to have a clear title for two years. Well, <clears throat> I guess I could opine on this. Um, the, <laughs> the, the, 
the two years is a shortened period. It used to be three years or longer. Um, there is a, uh, we rely heavily on, the towns rely heavily on the uh, treating the money that is owed us as taxes as if it's money in the bank. We have really strong powers for sale. On the other hand, once you flip it over and you sell it, where you are is that there are a lot of presumptions. You have to have done it exactly right. And there's an ability to challenge it for, for a few years. And if you haven't done it right, it can be reversed and therefore the buyer doesn't get it. So, but after two, there's a statute of limitations that after two years, they can't challenge it. So that's what right. you're talking about. That's what I'm talking about. So we have to proceed and uh, people who are buying know that. Okay, so that's, you know, do we, you want a motion to? Uh, I, I'd like a motion to uh, post the notice of intent to sale. So an okay. auction on January, Six. January 6th at 6 p.m. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. All those in favor say aye. 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 Nate, anybody? The ayes have it. Uh, do we want to put the floor as a minimum amount that we would accept, or do you want to just leave it up for auction? Minimum is taxes. Okay. Taxes and fees. Is that a motion? Yes, it is. Um, Is there a second? What, so what if we don't get it and we're stuck with it, paying rent on it forever? <laughs> well, the, the, they spend people that, that would pay it right now. Okay. Uh, but we have to go through the formality of this whole thing. Understood. Second. So it doesn't look like we're being unfair to others. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there discussion further? All those in favor say aye. 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 Town board voted for it. Okay, holiday jubilee advertising. So in the past, the town has made a donation uh, to Johnson Works for the uh, purposes of the buy local promotion, which was rolled in with the holiday jubilee and uh, kind of the whole, it was all one thing with there being no buy local promotion this year. There is still a holiday jubilee. Uh, and Johnson Works is asking if the town would make a contribution to help pay for uh, newspaper advertisements for the holiday jubilee. How much? Is there a spokesperson for Johnson Works? There is, yeah. Um, I think in the past, the town and the village have each contributed $250. Um, so we, uh, um, yeah, so we're, we're, but this year we're looking for 200 from each to pay for newspaper advertising. So are you saying it's $200 more or $50 less? $50 less. Oh, right. we can go for that. Is that a motion? Yes. It is specifically. I get a little bit more exact. $193.20. Then that's what my motion will be, Mr. Chief. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great thing. December 6th. Johnson Works does. Working communities challenge. All right, LCPC is taking the lead on the Working Communities Challenge. Uh, this came across our radar a little while ago, around the same time as the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation grant. Uh, this is a little bit more challenging uh, because of there's a minimum population size for your coalition to apply to this. Uh, so the uh, LCPC is taking the lead on building that coalition, and they've been pretty successful at it they are moving forward with their application. Um, I'd like to continue to be an active 
participant, but it's getting, <coughs> I, I thought it was worthwhile to kind of get the board's more formal approval. We express an interest in it in a very broad way, but uh, you know, I want to go to a few more meetings and I have uh, some additional work for this, but I think that the town of Johnson as an active participant stands to benefit pretty well on this. Can you remind me what it is? Uh, yes, the Working Communities Challenge is a, uh, this will be a grant program and this would go to uh, activities that were supported by the coalition. The coalition has been built with uh, Jenna's Promise. I'm not going to get everybody for the coalition, but uh, the, the Cheslove, the Community Health Services of Memorial Valley, Jenna's Promise, uh, I believe the university is participating in this. Uh, we're getting a pretty good group of people and we'll design some activities and some uses for the funds. Participating in it will allow us to have a say and help steer how the, the funds are used. So this is an economic development tool? Yes, it is. The name sounds like it. But it's yeah. Isn't it a pretty good chunk of money? Like It is, but it's a little bit hard to say how that's going to be awarded because it's, again, it is as a coalition, uh, so it's not like if we participate, we get awarded X number of dollars. It's right. X number of dollars get awarded to a broad set of purposes, and it does extend outside the Johnson, the borders of Johnson. Uh, so it, right. you know, includes well uh, the Loyal County Planning Commission are the ones taking the lead on this. So it, it pretty effectively includes the county. Uh, but we are steering it towards the. Uh, northern part of the county. Thoughts? Just you want just a consensus. Just a general ahead. consensus that you know this is another thing that's gonna take some of my time and attention. I think it's worthwhile. Uh, but LCPC's taking the lead. LCPC's taking the lead. So my contributions for this are not gonna be too much. Following the board? Yep. Kyle? Matt? Yes. Don yes. yes? Good. Okay. Next item, light industrial park update. Uh, working with Seth and uh, Tasha Wallace about working out the formal agreement that the board voted uh, to adopt at our last meeting. I don't have a very specific update on this, but Seth did, is continuing to work on this, developing the next statement with Seth and Ben Rose and on emergency management, uh, we'll get approved. We'll get a uh, kind of preliminary approval for the nexus statement, and that'll determine the particular pot of money that we apply for. Uh, but we're going. We're still going after the uh, emergency funds and uh, disaster mitigation for the late industrial park. So this is the million dollar grant. Yes, this is. Yeah, this is the the uh, little over a million dollars for the light industrial park. Um, and the grant, the avenue that appears most successful at this stage is still applying as a uh, recovery effort from uh, federally declared disasters in 2017 or 2018. Okay. That's pretty much it on that? Yes. All right. Um, I'd like to go to the applicate apply for community development block grant. The application for that before we get to review old business. So this is another piece that we're working on with Greg Tatro and Jenna's Promise. Uh, we had uh, members from Senator Leahy's office, uh, Ted Brady from. Agency of Commerce and Community Development uh, and other representatives from the state and federal programs down to uh, take a look at projects that we had in Johnson. And what we identified was the redevelopment of the Barrows building, uh, the former cafe. That redevelopment stands to bring a lot of activity to the town and restore uh, 
three central piece of our historic village. So they, they think it, it's a good target for a block grant. If you recall, the town applied for a block grant in the past uh, for the Sterling Market and uh, rebuilding the Sterling Market from the Grand Union into its current state. Uh, that was a pretty successful program. We're applying for something very similar this time. Uh, the large difference being that we would not apply in this case to recover funds to use as part of the uh, revolving loan fund. Uh, so that would simplify the application and uh, the kind of long-term reporting requirements uh, for the block grant. Do you know if um, the Tatro's plan to turn the borough's building in the cafe or whatever they're going to do there is that going to be part of the bigger the bigger nonprofit or is that a sep is that going to be part of our property tax rule or is it a it will be part of the property tax rule uh, to the best of my knowledge it is going that's going to be a for profit activity. Uh, it will be related to the nonprofit, mm -hmm. uh, but I do not believe. And again, I'm getting a little bit into Greg's business, but I do not believe that it's. Uh, I believe that it would pay property taxes. Mm -hmm. So the block grant can be can obviously go towards a for profit. The town would be applying for this, uh, uh -huh. and, but we. We can use it for economic development uh -huh. that involves a, a for-profit okay. institution, okay. just like we do with the sterling market. Right, right, right. Kim? No, that's part of my question about it being a private entity and we're using a community, community development, development grant right. to go towards something like that versus actually having it go through something that the town really needs, like the Jewett property. And I think the cafe, that it's great that there's any kind of helpful step up for that because especially if it would get on the tax roll, but I'm looking at it as taxpayers and, and this is a privately owned building versus we own as a town property that really needs uh, an economic boost as well. Just yep. enjoying that. So these are coming from different pots of money. Uh, the EDA is something that's available to us uh, and it does, as part of our application for the EDA, EDA funds, is the million dollar fund for the, the Jewett property, for the light industrial park. Uh, we do have to demonstrate that we are enabling private investment. In that. So our role is going to be, we're going to build a road up there and then when the road is built, We'll be able to sell parcels of the land and when we sell parcels of the land that will be private investment uh, in the town that there'll be private investment purchasing those properties and developing them into new businesses the cdbg grant is for more immediate private investment so that this isn't money that's being given to them with no strings attached uh, there are certain contributions and things that the Jenna's promise and the Tatros are going to have to do as part of their investment in order to secure the uh, CDBG. And there will be no expenses paid by the town for the CDBG funds. This is, uh, the town is a conduit, but the town is not spending town funds. Uh, Can we stipulate that, that it will be on the taxables? For that building, since getting help from the town and grant money and it would just be that if the town and Johnson would like to see that on the tax, can we, can that be a part of the agreement? I don't see why not. Or can you push for that? I was just, I'm just thinking so much need to have um, not a tax exempt. Um, yeah. no. It's my understanding, didn't we vote last week to be an applicant for them? To, to for the community development block grant I, last month i mean our last meeting we voted i don't recall voting for the community development block grant we voted and submitted for the robert wood johnson foundation 
Award, uh, which was another award that we were working in partnership with Dennis Marlis on, but not. Uh, and we, I, I, I thought I thought that Greg raised it, and we, and we did both. But uh, so, and I understood that the question tonight was whether or not in doing the application, uh, the we would authorize someone to work on the application in conjunction with you, but not to, to, to do the submission. Yes, that's the specific request I have. Um, you know, I think we may, I think that may have been something that was brought up in a prior meeting. Um, but the, the specific request I have is, uh, I, would, I wanna open the application for the CDPG funds and assign Amy Tatro to write the grant application, uh, but she I won't be granting her the authority to make the submission. I'll, I'll take it and I'll, I'll do all the review before anything is submitted on behalf of the town. So before you could do that, we, we would have to have voted to make it to, to be the applicant. Yes. And, and there's a question in, our, in, in your and my mind uh, whether or not this is the case. Robert Gray coming in it's and in talking it. about it. It's not in May it. have made. No. Oh, I didn't see it. No, it would have been earlier than November 4th. It would have been the. You remember, Donald? I was just looking at the. Uh, Thank you, Don. So addressing, Kim, your concern, we can find out what we can do with regard to the tax status of it. Uh, but we already went through with the, to, to be, be a lead applicant or the applicant for that grant. So. Uh, but I, I, I'm pretty confident that it, it it is not tax exempt, and then it will be on the tax form for the grant list. And you can look that up. And I will look it up and inform us all about the, that result. So maybe it can be the information at our next meeting we can have on the record so yep. people can check what, what that, that is. That was a good question, Kim. And another thing, too, you know, when he was talking about the road, it's also the infrastructure to uh, utilities and everything for the municipal you know, for the uh, Jewish property. So, right. The select board members' thoughts on having what is it, Amy? Yes. Tatro, this is online. You have to do it online. Yep. You. It's an online grant system where uh, you log in to you log into it and manages all your documents. It's pretty handy. Um, you know, normally, Rosemary and myself are the only ones that have authority to edit, read, or submit these documents. Um, but uh, I'm going to add Amy to this for this specific application. So she won't be able to get into other documents or other things that we have. She won't be able to make changes to anything else. She won't be able to submit anything without our review. Um, and would before it gets submitted, would you come to us and say, here's the document? Where, uh, where, do you, and where does that? I'd have to look over our decision from the October 21st. I believe I. I do not believe that you have authorized the submission at this point. Uh, but I'd look over your, I'd review your, your decision on that. But I, I, that I don't believe that you authorized the submission. I think you'll see a draft of it before we submit. Yeah, the motion is just that the town be the applicant, which I guess is a little vague. But whether it means you want to do the submission. What are the board's thoughts on uh, who can work on the application? Um, and Amy Tatro is who? Sorry, in relation to that. Uh, family or child? Daughter-in-law. 
Craig's daughter-in-law. Yes, I don't know. I don't know her at all. Uh, I've, I've worked with her on the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation grant, and I've worked with her on uh, yeah. uh, some of the health initiatives also. Well, I was going to say, I, I, I'm trusting your judgment on this. So, yeah, yeah it's good with me. If it's good with you. You well, recommend her? I, I do. And, and we will have an opportunity to review everything. Uh, but she, did, she and Gregory did a great job writing the essay that we used for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Uh, so I have confidence in them doing that again. Great. Uh, they're going to get help from LCPC and uh, the state at ACCD. Um, I think they might even, you know, the Senator Leahy's office was very supportive of this application and the redevelopment of the Barrows building and its relation to the nonprofit, um, you know, bringing a profit generating or a, a money generating and sustainability piece to uh, the whole endeavor uh, mm -hmm. helps its long term sustainability. Uh, it can be a really important piece. Okay. Consensus or just okay. go ahead. Okay. Kim, did you have one more thing to say? Or? No. I was just going to ask who was in charge of the grant. Like the, the, the cost of the grant writing is their cost, right? It's not the town's cost. Yes. Yeah. The 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 town's cost, I suppose, will be a little bit of my time. Um, where I'm going to, like I said before, since we are the applicant, I'll be review, reviewing all materials before it's submitted. Uh, but I'm not expecting that to be a uh, large amount of time. Scott? We don't know what a large amount of time is for you and a little bit of time. So sometimes when you are talking about a little bit of time for a large amount of time, we have no clue what that is. So if you could sort of spin that Uh, it's for the community development block grant. I've got a pretty good handle on this. So I think that I'm pretty confident saying that it'll, it'll be about 25 hours worth of work total, uh, that I expect it to be, uh, you know, several half days, uh, you know, uh, checking in for a few periods and then, uh, a more comprehensive review. Um, I think that that is a, I think it'll be less than that. Uh, the backing up to the uh, Working Communities Challenge, I'm a little bit less familiar with their process uh, for that grant. So I I don't have as, I, I don't have as good of an understanding of what the time commitment's going to be for that, but we're not the lead on that in any capacity. So I would think that that might even, there's a pretty good chance that that would be less time than that. Um, you know, I know that I'm going to be attending a couple meetings, you know, a couple hours a piece. Uh, I'm not expecting more than that, writing a couple, maybe a little letter of support, doing a little bit of demographic statistical work. Um, you know, I'd estimate that one probably less than 20 hours. Um... But I think Got to follow up. I just wanted to thank you for that because otherwise we really don't have uh, an idea of what we're talking about. Sure. Yeah. I'm... Um, review all business. Anyone? Scott? Yeah. Um, I think this is a pretty kind of great stuff. Myself, as well as a bunch of other people, are trying to figure out overall costs to date on the Jewish property. Consultants and legal review. Correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't there some kind of annual retainer for keeping that property available? To there was a, a fee for an option. A fee for an option. Is there any tracking of how much we've spent to date in an estimate of what we're planning on spending on that property? I would assume Rosemary could figure out what we have spent. Yeah, what we're planning to spend might be more from 
Right. Yep. So can we get that amount sometime in the near future, hopefully before town meeting? Yep. Okay. It just seems like we're, we're spending a lot. We want to drive by that access road. I mean, there's trees down there. Barely looks like a trail anymore. <coughs> and we have maps and prints and all the shirt going on it. But when you physically drive by it, it's barely noticeable as anything anymore. And now there's lowdowns on that access road. Well, I'm not even going to call it an access road anymore. It's a trail. And my understanding is you'll be asking, um, you know, taxpayers to shut up more cash in the future. Have we actually had business owners interested in you know, hardware to pick up some more um, clientele for their park? I'm not sure if the more still is still is there industrial park, but I'm just wondering where this is all leading. And it's been several years since we pulled the trigger on this, and I thought it was novel idea, you know, possibly get jealous on that. But I'm wondering who's keeping track of cash or spending. I mean, this should be a conversation every time we talk about this industrial park where we are financially and what we have to have financially to make this thing a reality. And who's our client base? Um, every time I come to one of these meetings, it's vague. You know, I hear it should be Close to owning it? Do we own it? We own it. We bought it, right? Uh, we're still paying the uh, we're paying it down still. We're paying it down, but we own it. Yeah. All right. Well, if any of you may, I speak to this chart. Use one of your questions were that do we have anybody interested in having a, a lot up there? Well, you know as well as I do that. It's difficult to try to sell something that has no infrastructure to it, you know. And once the infrastructure gets to it, then you know we're hoping that we do have people interested. And that was what it was right from the get-go about this. They were kind of unanswered questions. Uh, people still did go forward to buy the Jewett property, but we had discussed that we were trying to get grants and try to have the minimal amount of expense to the taxpayers, yeah. as you recall. Yeah. But there's also comments, because I was there for that town meeting, there was frustrations amongst some of the taxpayers in Johnson that there was no tangible business plan except for this is going to be, you know, potentially a good thing for the town. And I'm hoping it still is, but my interest is how much have we spent on this? Where are we going? Uh, the I don't know if I can answer all of your questions, Scott, but with the chair's permission, I can Go on. try. Um, the the money that we're spending on it now is really uh, just the we're finishing the purchase price on it. That is the only outgoing money. And we're not collecting property taxes on it because we own it. Right. Uh, and so that that's really the expense we haven't. We don't have paid consultants or, or advertising or anything for it. We've had a few people express an interest in the property, but nobody who's willing to buy it until it's developed. Uh, and that was the state we were in that. You know, nobody wanted to buy any parts of it uh, when we didn't own it. We couldn't sell any of the parts. Uh, we couldn't. We haven't been able to sell any of the parts until we uh, lay out the infrastructure. Uh, so there's no guarantee that anybody's going to buy it when we do the next part. When
one we just make the infrastructure. Uh, we think that there's interest there. Uh, we have a number of unique features that we have uh, better utilities and more capacity than uh, neighboring towns and their industrial parks. Uh, we think that we can attract business because of that, uh, but it, it's not a guarantee. Would it be possible? Uh, again, this is a total visual thing. Driving by that accident, if the United States trail like that does have a native town highway for a big kind of road here, and kind of open that road up a little bit, at least to the low downs now. So if somebody is interested and they wanted to walk the land and get an idea of the lay of the land, they could actually access that. And if you're worried about Maybe we could even put a sign, future home of the Johnson yeah, Industrial sorry. Park. Yeah. It's not currently a town road. No, no, no. no it's, a pro it's a property we own. I understand. I'm saying it's not a town road. It's just going to you know, maintain the existing town roads. Why would you go and maintain that road? Well, you, you, if you have a right of way to town owned property, we could cut the right of way. So that's a suggestion. But that sign will probably cost taxpayer dollars. Yeah, we'll need a consultant for that. Yeah. <laughs> so can I guess? We do. There is a vast trail there, and there is a VASA trail there now as well. I'm surprised that to hear that uh, it doesn't seem trail like, given the, what we've been told from VASA. You said trail lake? <laughs> okay. Gotcha. So, Charlie, do you have anything on our old business, such as uh, broadband? Yeah. Highlights? Well, we're, the committee hasn't met since I last report, so I don't want to comment on broadband, having recently read the village meeting notes, it sounds like the village had some interest and some questions for the broadband committee, and it would be great if you could connect with them, or you could connect with them, or you could connect with them. Or... The, I can answer that. Great. At this point in time, we feel that the village is right. And so the broadband committee is not, not really looking at doing it inside the village limits. And there, the village people are not happy with contracts, but it's about the best option in this time. Because the, question, the, the questions weren't mine, necessarily, no, no. so I'm just... Um, so I, if, but I'm answering to the village. So if you ask the question, and you want me to talk to them, it's on you. Right, but my question is, uh, could you have someone from the one, either a village trustee or someone into one of your meetings so that you could talk directly instead of having me as an intermediary? But I do have some nuts on the old business. Yeah. I assume the budget is old business, the upcoming budget. Nope. But if you haven't talked about that at all. Nope. Okay. Then I'll reserve my comment for you. I will say on broadband that one thing that I learned recently was that uh, for districts, if you combine districts, you can gerrymander a district so it's not a town-wide district. That uh, if you and uh, what is it, a CUD? Communications CDU district. I don't know. One or the other. Yeah, that those districts, you know, you can have a gerrymandered district around. Uh, well-served areas that can be multiple towns and can bond for its own and not use tax yeah, dollars. I think I've seen that quite a while ago. What Dr. referring to is you can gerrymand district, but to get a communications union district, you have to have more than one town involved, and it's outside of the town government. The, the district can issue bonds 
there are no revenue bonds, there are non-recourse bonds, and the, the bond gets defaulted on the town tax base, or not all on the book for the money. Uh, and this does take at least two towns to fill the district. And they don't have to be contiguous. And the gerrymandered portions of the district don't have to be contiguous. Gerrymandered portions of the town. Of, of, yeah. For instance, you could get Sinclair Road beyond Barry Collins to be part of the district. And you and I could be in another part of the district. Um, obviously, those two areas don't touch. Any, any other old business questions to be addressed? Uh, I guess I will bring it up related to the budget and our prior discussion about the sheriff's budget. Uh, it looks like Roger's given us updated numbers that are uh, a lot better than that, and I'm meeting with him tomorrow. Uh, for a little more detail. What time is that meeting? What meeting going to be? That meeting tomorrow, you guys will have it. Noon. Noon. Anybody can go? No. <laughs> Roger invited me to lunch. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Roger invited me to lunch. Mike always buys. And I'm already <laughs> tagging along. <laughs> Uh, I here I was going to get a free lunch. Sorry, Mike. You, you put a wrench in the works. All right, sorry, I, man. I think uh, we're about ready to adjourn. Any any yeah, you questions yeah, from I, you I, folks? I, no. Are, are you adjourning now? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, I have two things really quick. Um, one is the I I I could call the clerk or The state has just landed on people about stormwater runoff, I believe, and they've nope. they've reduced it. And they, they you know, I, I'm sure that they're, that uh, Northern Vermont University is on their list of properties with more than three acres, which is what their rule is now, I believe. Great. I'm sorry, I'm not understanding what you're proposing or offering to. I understand the issue that with stormwater runoff on dipped in. Well, there's a, there's a couple of grants that I, that I saw were available, and I didn't know, like, when Leia was here, you say, hey, Leia, these grants, and she would, you know, they could apply for the grant and right. get things rolling, and I didn't know if Brian does that, but he's yeah. really busy, but yes. I don't know if that's something you want to look into, or if that's something that um, I can try to follow and see if I can make any kind of budge on it. Gotcha. I, it seems like a great opportunity. Brian's time does seem taxed and a half. Um, 
Uh, I can work with you, Kim, and we'll find out a little bit more about it, and then you said it's the beginning of December is when it's due? Yeah. So, um, and we'd have to... No. I just wonder if someone from LCPC could actually say, yeah, we can put in, uh, you know, a grant for you or something easy like that, because they, yeah. if the tour did work on it, the grant for it has been um, applied for in the past, then they might have paperwork that actually they could just Reapply it. Yeah. Who would who would be the applicant? Northern Vermont University. Well, that's that's the piece I guess. Mm -hmm. I, I would think that Johnson would have an interest in it, but it's affecting our village and our town and our yeah. water. So that that's the piece that I guess yeah. I'm asking. I, I I used that argument earlier, so I understand that. Yeah. Yeah. But would the you know would the town be willing to support something like that on expenses like that? Conceptually, they, yeah. They, they had a design many years ago to put green things to bring down the water runoff and try and slow it down. And, um, I, it, I, again, when I asked about it, they didn't have any this position. Well, there, there must be more pressure on them now at this point, I would think. I don't know. I think they've done. <laughs> well, the, the lack of money clearly is, is, is an issue. But every business has Everything a lot of cash. Oh no. You know, I I understand that from speaking to Dan Noyes that P and R lumber, you know, in business, out of business, you know. With this type of thing. Well, you, you heard uh, Brian's answer. Yeah, we can talk to Megan at L C P C and check into it ourselves a little bit more. Um, Megan's Often kind of my go to for stormwater. So uh, that's my first thought. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Evidently, there was no more follow up on the budget building ordinance. We had a number of questions. Uh, it's been submitted and I, I don't have you an don't answer have yet. Uh, another thing, too, Mr. Chairman, I'm surprised we're not talking about the coal storage building tonight. That building in the last few years has been quite problematic. Uh, this is not the first time we've had frozen pipes uh, there, and uh, maybe we should stick it on the agenda or something for the next meeting. Okay. Because I didn't mention it earlier, uh, so uh, probably that'd be the place to take it. So, Brian, didn't you say you and Lisa were coming up with a plan for that building? That's my thought, is to try and come up with something a little more comprehensive. And we passed it, it's no longer a an emergency and but it happened last year yeah, yeah. And, and what we've done in the past is patch it and yeah. move on uh so i'm thinking that maybe we talk a little bit more about what do we need to do to make it so it's not a recurring uh, right on, on supporting mike i always thought that the uh use of this as cold storage is bad use for for building that could be an economic generator for the community it's part of the, the area-wide brownfield thing, so it, it, it's a broader, it's a broad subject as far as, I mean, and not just, uh, you know, cold proofing it. That's a good point, Dave. Scott? There's just one other little thing. Top Clay Hill, where the railway house used to be, that ditch is blown out, so the water's sort of eating away at Clay Hill. It's undermining the it's undermining the you called me, Kim. I kind of communicate that down. That hasn't we haven't seen a resolution up there. I I don't know. There's no argument. Okay. All right. Well, you're aware of it. And I, I'm aware of it, uh, and it, it should be on their list. So I'll follow up. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Mr. Chair, when are you going to start talking about that? Yeah, my, I, I think bring it before the board at our first meeting in December. That's a normal fact. Charlie, if you've got a question, I'm happy to talk uh, about it with you. I wanted to point out that. Uh, Social Security is going up 1.6%. But the health insurance is going up. Now, I don't want to give you a percentage on this 
not apples and apples completely. The average social security recipient after the increase in health insurance amounts to about 0.8 percent. So you might want to bear that in mind when you look at taxes this year versus taxes next year. So are you saying Medicare point uh, Part B is going to go up? It's going to go up nine. It's going to go up to forty four fifty. Well, one thirty nine. It's going up nine dollars. So the average Social Security recipient gets less than a thousand dollars. At one point six percent, that's five hundred thirty eight. The average of eight percent. So it looks like the average increase in jobs would be about point eight percent. Point eight percent. Well, I would like to, unless there's anything else, uh, close the meeting. Thank you. All right. Declare it adjourned.